I often talk about what I like to call the rule of thirds. The premise behind the idea is that when it comes to sitting down to eat, it's a good idea to mix things up, to include some carbs, some protein, and some fat. The value of this approach is that it optimizes the postprandial signaling. It's actually a principle Mother Nature starts us out on. If you take a look at the macronutrient composition of normal cow's milk, 200 milliliters of milk will leave you with 7 grams of protein, 9.5 grams of carbohydrate, and 7.4 grams of fat. It's not exact, but it is approximately one third protein, one third carbs, and one third fat. Now, I must point out that in the case of human milk, the exact composition varies. The fat content is marginally higher and the protein content is a little lower, but the principle holds. The rule of thirds also applies to the traditional Western meal of meat and potatoes, but it is something that is often not done in modern eating scenarios. Carbs are almost always there. Fats also often make an appearance. Unfortunately, the form that they take is not always optimum. Refined fats like margarine and soy oil are not in the same league as the more natural fats. Protein? Well, it's frequently missing. Or the amount is too little to count. One egg in a sea of flour, sugar and margarine is just not enough to get the protein signaling going. That's why I talk about the rule of thirds. Now, you don't have to stick to a third Absolutely, but you do need to have enough of everything to ping the signaling. Now, most of the time, the protein and fat benefit is attributed to the fact that these nutrients trigger the I am full message. Basically, they help you put down your fork or spoon before things get ugly. But there's more to the signaling than just satiety. And this is particularly important if better sugar control is your goal. And it's not quite as straightforward as one would expect. In terms of the biochemistry, carbohydrates ping insulin release. And insulin is in charge of putting away many of the groceries not just sugar. But as more of the science has been uncovered, it turns out proteins also ping insulin release. The effect is not direct, it's via via, and this video explains all the details. But in summary, incretins trigger alpha cells to release glucagon, which triggers the beta cells to release insulin. And then, well, insulin puts away the sugar. Officially, Fats? Well, they do nothing. Or, if you're thinking at a cellular level, fatty acids are actually bad because they stop glucose uptake, thanks to the phenomenon that has been dubbed the Randall cycle. Basically, a cell at any moment can only use one fuel source. Now, most cells don't give a damn which one it is. They're happy to use glucose or fat. They just will not use both at the same time. What characterizes the metabolically healthy is that switching between fuel sources is effortless. When you're metabolically challenged, you are invariably metabolically inflexible, which means making that switch is a big deal. And this leads to sugars accumulating and big bellies. But it turns out fats are right in the thick of things in terms of the sugar story. Join us for this episode of Better Body Chemistry TV as we explore how eating fat helps you put away sugar more efficiently. Better Body Chemistry TV is brought to you by Dr. Sandy, a scientist turned gremlin buster, helping you battle sugar gremlins, heffalumps, and other health horribles through Better Body chemistry. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health. When dietary fats are talked about, we are primarily talking about triglycerides. These are three fatty acids which are then stuck onto a glycerol molecule. But triglycerides are the storage form of fats. In fact, in this form, 
the fats are inert. To be useful, the fatty acids must be separated from the glycerol, and in this form, they're referred to as free fatty acids. Now, the fatty acids that are found in dietary fats are pretty long. Carbon lengths range from 14 to 26 carbons. So when we talk about them, we refer to them as the long chain fatty acids, and they interact with free fatty acid receptors. For the record, these free fatty acids can be saturated, that is, they only have one bond between the carbon, or unsaturated, that is, that they have a double bond between one or more of the carbons. This isn't particularly important in this story. Our story begins in the small intestine, where the triglycerides are pulled apart with the help of bile and lipases. When it comes to putting away sugar, it is these free fatty acids that do the heavy lifting. They worm their way to the enteroendocrine cells that line the gut and trigger their free fatty acid receptors. This then precipitates the release of gut hormones from their respective cell types. I cells release cholecystokinin, L cells release GLP-1, and K cells release GIP. The GLP and GIP whoosh through to the pancreas, prompting beta cells to release insulin and alpha cells to release glucagon. It's the incretin effect all over again, and this helps to put the sugars away. But the benefits don't stop here, because it turns out that beta cells, just like the enteroendocrine cells, have free fatty acid receptors. If the blood glucose levels are high, something that should only be happening when you've just eaten something yummy, the free fatty acids that are circulating in the blood give beta cells a prod to produce insulin, enhancing insulin release. Now, at this stage, the details of how this happens is not clear, but what is known is it's an inside job. It happens inside of the beta cells. But it is important to note that the beta cell response to free fatty acids is nuanced. If the free fatty acids arrive alone, that is, the glucose levels are low, nothing happens. Mother Nature is so smart. Unfortunately, when you're diabetic or pre-diabetic, your glucose levels are high when they're not supposed to be. This creates a situation where there are high sugar levels and high free fatty acid levels at the same time, and it triggers inappropriate insulin release. This biology definitely doesn't serve you. Some would argue that it is the problem. But it's important to keep uh, this in perspective. The ability of dietary fats to churn out insulin is first and foremost a postprandial phenomenon, which is why eating a little fat with dinner can be most helpful. All it takes to get this biology working for you is to obey the rule of thirds every time you eat. That means at breakfast, at lunch, at supper time, as well as with the in-betweens. This is one of the easiest tweaks that you can make to your eating habits, and it will go a long way to helping you create better body chemistry. If you're ready to give it a try and need a little help and support, consider joining the Better Body Chemistry community. You can find the links in the description below. Alternatively, visit our website at www.betterbodychemistry.com. Browse our library or enroll in one of our courses or programs. The advice is simple to follow and based on real science, not hype. Know someone struggling to keep their sugar levels under control? Share this video with them so they know how to structure their meals to maximize insulin release. And if this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe to our channel so you catch future episodes of Better Body Chemistry TV. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Remember, small things can make a big difference to your health.